Hello, I'm Aisha Kader. I'm part of the American Heart Association's Early Career Blogging Program. And on account of International Clinical Trials Day, which is on the 20th of May, it is my distinct privilege to host Professor Martin Landry for a brief discussion. He is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Nuffield Department of Population Health and deputy director at the Big Data Institute at the University of Oxford. More importantly, he is co-chief investigator of the recovery trial, which we very well know is the world's largest COVID-19 drug trial. Welcome, Professor Landry, and thank you for your time today. It's a complete pleasure. So we've heard, well, almost legendary anecdotes about how rapidly the recovery trial was set up. And interestingly, that much of the inspiration was drawn from trials, randomized control trials within cardiology. Could you tell us a bit about the evolution of recovery, why we need this kind of large RCTs during the pandemic, and particularly how you managed to set it up and running so quickly? Yes, I mean, it was born out of need and an, and an observation. This is a new disease. Um, the mortality for patients admitted to hospital is about one in four. One in four patients who get into a hospital don't come out of it alive. Um, and there are uh, no known treatments, or there were no known treatments. And it also struck us that it was unlikely there was going to be a single big cure. If there had been a single big cure, it would have been found by the time the pandemic hit the UK in, in March 2020. Um, having you know, uh, really torn its way through both uh, China and, and Northern Italy uh, and one or two other places. But it seemed that if we wanted to find treatments that work and differentiate them, those that have a lot of expectation but turn out not to work, we needed randomization and we needed large numbers. And it reminded me of the first trial report I ever read when I was a medical student, which was the ISIS-2 uh, trial uh, report. And the beauty and the simplicity of that, that uh, with a one page case report form with clear outcomes, more focus on mortality. Um, uh, and um, in fact, in that case, with a factorial design, which we did come back to later, um, that one could get really compelling answers fast. And that's what we needed to do. But more importantly than that, or, or as importantly as that was actually the trial has to be practical. In a pandemic, it's actually true in the rest of our medical lives, but in a pandemic particularly, patient, uh, patients are um, anxious, sick, alone in a pandemic, and the doctors are overloaded. Um, they have very little time. They're emotionally overburdened. Um, so any work that you expect people to do that's above and beyond the, the minimum that, uh, sort of standard of care that they have to do uh, has to be really justified. And on the front of the protocol for the ISIS-2 trial, which I had on my desk as I was writing the recovery protocol, there is a, uh, a paragraph which we should all read, which said something like, uh, the success of the trial depends on the extent to which everyday uh, uh, doctors and nurses choose to enter their patients into the clinical trial. Hence, the work must be and is uh, uh, absolutely uh, minimal. And that was the motive. We had to make this simple and practical. Um, but we also had to make it robust. We had to make sure that when we got answers, the world would believe them. Um, and I think if you look at the results of hydroxychloroquine, when you look at the results of dexamethasone, that was achieved. Speed, you asked about speed. Well, um, uh, the one thing about pandemics are their speed. Um, uh, pandemics are like normal uh, clinical trials, normal life, if you like, but substantially higher profile than in every page of the newspaper and every bit of news coverage and with a dramatically reduced timeline. So we went from protocol to um, first patient in nine days. We went to 10,000 patients in eight weeks. Uh, by 100 days, we had 12,000 patients in the first three results. Um, and it scaled on from then uh, over this past winter where sadly we've had a huge upsurge in, ca in cases over, this, over the winter in the UK um, where we went on to study many other drugs. But it really was the success was focus on what matters, make sure it's randomized, uh, make sure you have complete follow-up of information. We use routine data from record systems and make sure it's practical and accessible to doctors and patients. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. I think the numbers speak for themselves. Recovery has really been truly impressive, recruiting almost 40,000 patients, as you said, uh, in the middle of a pandemic where staff are already overstretched. Uh, how else was this trial stream streamlined in such a way that there was minimal burden to those staff that were directly involved in clinical care? Yeah, so we, we used an open label design, so there wasn't a placebo. Um, uh that's practical and is also um perf provides perfectly robust information in the context of randomization um where you're focusing on really clear uh, outcomes you know our primary outcomes mortality and it's mortality that is by and large captured through national death certificates i mean it's essentially it's pretty much if you like the legal definition of uh of death so we were going to get and we did get complete coverage um, so uh, the uh, randomization system uh, required only about 10 um, uh, fields to be filled in, so a very short the equivalent of a one page case report form. A simple randomization took about 10 minutes for, in, for the entire process and at the end of which came a um, please prescribe using your usual hospital prescription system, whatever the allocated treatment might be, or your, your patient has been uh, assigned to the usual standard of care, please carry on with that. So the treatments were then issued uh, as, um, uh, uh, as part of routine care. So in a sense, we've taken the entire routine care pathway and all we've done is inserted a coin toss in the middle of it. Um, and that coin toss is the difference between getting results you can believe and results which are um, uh, uh, and, and, and just not tr trustworthy. And as I say, you know, you get clear results, you get uh, convincing answers, you change practice and patients in the second wave in the UK were treated you know, better with better drugs and avoided um, ineffective drugs because of the results that came from the first wave and the same has been true around the world. Absolutely. I think what you said is key about uh, leveraging existing frameworks and then incorporating it into routine clinical care. That's that's probably the best way to maximize recruitment in any setting. Uh, yeah, if so, I may just expand, expand on that. Yes, of course. Hospitals and clinics and doctors and nurses and pharmacists, they're professional setups. They have their standards. They have reporting and accountability mechanisms. Uh, they have professional standards. We have to build on that, not try, not pretend it doesn't exist and impose some alternative standards just because it's a clinical trial. Build on what's there, build on what's good that's there and then say, what's the difference? And the difference is that you insert the randomization. One final piece of streamlining was we were able to link into about 25 different national data sets, which gave us information, everything from the COVID testing status uh, through to mortality, data on ethnicity or race, uh, data on um, comorbidities and so on. So using that routine data also meant that if it was being collected once for routine care, you didn't have to collect it a second time uh, just because it's a trial. Um, and so I think that that has been the one other uh, addition which has been very, very powerful. Absolutely. I think that's that's very impressive. If, if we speak a bit about uh, the trial design. So recovery had a very unique trial design. It was an adaptive platform trial. Could you please walk us through what an adaptive platform trial is? How is this different from other regular uh, randomized control trial designs? And why indeed might this be the ideal trial design for something like recovery? Well, I'm not sure I set out or we set out to make call it an adaptive platform trial. Um, we set out to do the trial which we thought would work in the circumstances and it turns out that's adaptive and platform. So platform because uh, there's one single protocol, it's been modified a number of times since as drugs have come and gone, um, uh, and that um, there are multiple treatments that patients could get. And before any randomization is done, before any coin is tossed, the doctors can say, I would be happy for this patient to either get or not get, let's say, dexamethasone and hydroxychloroquine, but let's say I would, they, I can see a contraindication to lapinavir or something. You make those distinctions up front before randomization, so there's, you, there's no bias. Then the coin is tossed and patients are allocated uh, to one of those treatments or to controls. And then you compare uh, patients with um, like for like. So that if the coin could come down head, it would be dexamethasone. If it came down tails, it would be it would be controls. That's the comparisons you do. 
and adaptive because over time um, uh, we have answered some questions. Um, and in fact, all the original drugs, the original four drugs we had uh, in the trial, we've answered those during um, uh, 2020. And we've been able to add in additional drugs. And one of the things we've done over, the, over time is actually to add in factorial elements. So just like that ISIS-2 trial, which was, if you remember, aspirin versus not and streptokinase versus not, we have, for example, uh, had a, a time when we had um, azithromycin versus not, but we also had aspirin versus not, and we also had colchicine versus not. So patients could get three drugs or no drugs or some combination in between. But because it's a factorial design, back to the classic principles of the 1980s, nothing new, you're able to provide robust and unbiased estimates of the effects or separate effects of aspirin versus not uh, uh, dexamethasone or azithromycin versus not and so on and so forth. So that factorial element has been also, I think, extremely powerful, particularly during this last, uh, this last wave. I mean, if you think that you know, we managed to answer both the aspirin and the colchicine questions within about three months um, simultaneously over the course of this past winter. That's, that's actually very, very impressive to even listen to. So to what extent would you say that, that recovery has changed the clinical trials landscape and, and the way in which we might be doing clinical trials in the future? I think over the last 20 or 30 years, we have made clinical trials elitist. You have to have special qualifications, work for special organizations, have a title like professor, or research fellow or uh, work for a clinical research organization or whatever. But the reality is that the real um, uncertainties about how to treat or not treat patients occur at the bedside. I mean, in the case of recovery, literally at the bedside. In the cases of much of outpatient care, it's when, the, when patients come to your office um, or when they're seen in the community. But it's at that interaction that the uncertainty is and you insert the randomization there and so what we're doing is bringing the clinical trials back into the real world, not real world evidence, not non-randomized biased evidence, put, put the toss of a coin into the real world with real patients, with real doctors, in real hospitals, in real time. And that I think has been the major transformation and that I think you know, really has to be here to stay. And if we can do that, and we can do that in partnership with day-to-day -day clinicians and, and patients, there's a, a, a very bright future. If I give you some figures on that, in recovery, 40,000 patients have been recruited uh, in every hospital in the country. 4,000 doctors and nurses have contributed one way or another to part of that effort. And uh, that's about one in 10 of all patients who've been admitted to hospital this last year with COVID are in the trial. So it really is collaborative, and participatory and transparent because everything about the trial from the IRB submissions and the regulatory submissions, the DM, data monitoring committee letters, the results, study recruitment, patient information, training leaflets, everything is open on the public publicly accessible website. So we've made it a trial that is for all of us. Um, and that, that I think again has been part of your know, tri clinical trials and not some um, odd uh, rarity, um, some special case that happens in a different world. Put the randomization back into clinical care, get robust answers, learn fast, get relevant answers, and then act on the information. Look at convalescent plasma, you know, used very, very widely by hundreds of thousands of people on a hypothesis, an untested hypothesis an untested promise, which when you do the randomized trials, at least in the hospital setting, as we've done, you can find no meaningful clinical benefit. It doesn't mean there's no benefit at all, but certainly no meaningful clinical benefit. Do the trial first, get the right answer, then act. Don't mix up that order. Randomization is key. Absolutely. And I think this is really, it just goes to show what a gold standard a randomized control trial is when, when we need to find answers to where there really is a clinical equipoise. So I think what you said about collaborative, that sort of segs, is a good segue into my next question. Professor Landry, you lead uh, the Good Clinical Trials Collaborative, which was launched last June and is supported by 
the Wellcome Trust, Gates Foundation, and the African Academy of Sciences. So what is the objective of this Good Clinical Trials Collaborative? And what does this mean for the future of clinical trials guidelines and regulations? You spoke a bit uh, about how it should be for everyone. Perhaps you could expand on this. Yes. The, this comes back to this area where we have made trials too hard. Um, there is this imagination that trials are risky. I would argue very strongly that giving a lot of people hydroxychloroquine when you don't know it works is risky. Not saying that you shouldn't give people dexamethasone because there isn't the randomized evidence, saying you won't give people dexamethasone and possibly even shouldn't trial it, that's risky. Giving people convalescent plasma when you don't know it works, that's risky. So we need randomized evidence. So that's the first thing. But we need guidelines that are based on the principles that underpin randomized trials. So um, the principles that um, uh, both of randomization of adequate sample size, not every trial has to be huge, but it has to be of adequate size of robust analysis, but also ethical principles, uh, ethical principles about fair partnership with patients, about the relevant levels of information. Um, uh, about the relevant partnerships between the haves and the have-nots, different parts of the world, uh, um, why you know, the relationship between big academia and those community hospitals that actually see all the patients, um, uh, partnerships with those patients. So uh, the, you know, the fundamental principles of, of randomized trials, the ethical partnerships, the principle of quality by design um, in order to really deliver um, uh, robust results. And we have to do this in a way that allows innovation. Rules set by ICH and others in 1995, um, based on essentially the state of the arts of technology being carbon copy paper, and does the top copy match the bottom copy, are, if they ever were relevant, they are certainly no longer relevant. And although if you look at many revisions of those rules, they change the language, the mentality is still there. How do I know that this, this document matches that document? What I'm interested in is not whether those documents match, I'm interested in whether the answers are answers I can trust. And that's a different question, and that's where the guidelines have to be. So the Good Clinical Trials Collaborative involves, you know, it's, it's worldwide, it involves regulators, it involves clinical trialists, academic clinical trialists, it involves, in, involves the commercial sector, it involves patients, it involves non-commercial uh, 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 funders um, and many others besides. In a sense, trying to establish what are the principles that make a randomized trial a good randomized trial and then use those principles that people can then use to guide them to actually deliver trials that are like recovery. Start with principles. Don't, don't start with um, a, a set of um, detailed requirements that say you must record this in this location and it must be signed and it must be dated and the date must be in this order uh, and so on and so forth. That is a barrier to innovation and it's a barrier to improvements in health and we have to we have to tackle that problem. Absolutely. I think that's that's a very good note to stop on. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Landry, for this very educational and insight, insightful discussion around clinical trials. I appreciate you taking the time today. It was an absolute honor to have met you. And most of all, thank you for everything you've done and continue to do with the recovery trial. Thank you so much. Thank you.